Go ahead and flip with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. If you're new to Story Church, we've been preaching through the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's hard to believe that we only have two weeks left, this week and next week. It's been such a fun book. I've loved studying and, and preaching and, and learning and, and being convicted and repenting uh, through the book of Ecclesiastes. And so today we're going to be in chapter 9, verse 11, all the way through the end of chapter 10. And we're not going to do our, our typical standing for the scripture reading today. We're just going to kind of work Work through the passage together. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible um, on these tables here in the back, there should be a Bible for you, our gift to you. Please keep that and follow along this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Today's sermon is titled Wisdom and Folly. Wisdom and folly, wisdom and foolishness. So let's go ahead and play a little fill in the blank game here for a second. It's not gonna be a long game, there's just one. So fill in the blank here for this phrase. You know it, life's not blank. Life's not what? Fair, yes, it worked. I didn't know if it would work. Uh, We've learned this, we've lived this, we've walked in this, Christian or not, we ask questions like, why do good things happen to bad people? Or why do bad things happen to good people as if there was such a thing? Why am I the person who worked so hard, who saved and invested and didn't spend frivolously, who did everything the right way and then I lost it all in the recession? Meanwhile, the guy who lived in stunning debt is somehow farther ahead than the rest of us. Why is it that way? Because life's not fair. And if you were here a couple of weeks ago when when Pastor Chris Lewis from Foothill Church came, he touched on this topic and the preacher here in Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 is gonna expand upon that. We're gonna look at that a little more closely today. Life is not fair. Look at how the preacher opens the section. Chapter nine, verses 11 through 13. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught up in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Go ahead and stop right there. You see what the preacher's saying right there? He says the fastest doesn't always win the foot race, right? Think the classic children's thing, the turtle and the hare, right? The battle doesn't always go to the strongest, think David and Goliath. Riches don't always go to the intelligent, think Paris Hilton, right? The fa- favor and blessing Don't always go to the one with the most knowledge. The preacher is saying plainly to us, life isn't fair. And no amount of human ability, human experience, human education can prepare us for the success or lack of success in life. The preacher says time and chance happen to them all. What does this mean? Well, the preacher, when he's using the word there, time, he's not speaking about strictly minutes and seconds. What the preacher is talking about is the idea of seasons of life, right? I've been in conversation with many of you before, and and you'll say something like, I'm just in a busy season, or I'm just in a season where I'm tired. That's how the preacher is using the word time, or yeah, time. He's saying there's seasons, and they're going to fluctuate on you. There's going to be good seasons and bad seasons. There's going to be happy seasons and mourning seasons. There's going to be seasons of fasting and seasons of feasting. If you were to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, you would read the poem there from the preacher where he says there's a time, a time, a time, a time. He's speaking of seasons here and and how seasons will fluctuate upon us. And then he's using the word chance. He says time and chance happen to all of us. Is, is, is the word chance fate? No, Christians are not fatalists. We do not believe in fate. We believe in sovereignty, and we'll look at that in a moment. When the preacher is using the word chance, he is speaking about the lack of predictability in life. Again, you can have all the experience, all the money, 
all the education and you cannot insulate yourself from the changing seasons. You cannot predict the changing of seasons in this world. Solomon himself, right, the main character of Ecclesiastes was richer, more intelligent, more well-prepared than all of us. And yet time and chance happened to him because life isn't fair. The preacher is saying the misfortunes and sufferings of life are inescapable regardless of how fast, strong, wise, intelligent, or knowledgeable you are. And then the preacher will go on to use two different examples. He'll use the example of a fish and of a bird. So a fish in the, in the depths of the ocean hides in the darkness of the ocean, hides in coral reef of the ocean. They're shifty and quick, and yet even those fish get caught in a net. They cannot escape being caught in a snare. And then he talks about the birds who fly far above us and have nests and trees that we can't climb, and yet they get shot out of the air. Why? Time and chance happens to all of us. So these verses teach us plainly life isn't fair. Life just is not fair. And the harsher truth, coming to Christ in faith, does not guarantee you a life of fairness. A life of grace, absolutely, but a life of fairness, it's not guaranteed. As a matter of fact, coming to Christ in faith is almost like signing the down payment on a future of suffering. Oftentimes, our desire for holiness, our desire for living like Jesus Christ is going to rub and bump up, bump up against the brokenness and the sinfulness and the darkness of this world. That's just going to happen. If you're living for Jesus, you're gonna face suffering in this dark world. And life is not gonna be fair to you and to me. And so what we have to do, friends, is just confront this reality head on. The preacher is not giving us any outs. He is saying, just confront reality. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't ignore it. Just look at it and see that life's not fair. And then instead of asking the question, why me? Ask the question, what then? If life's not fair, what then shall I do? How then shall I live? If we just ask these questions, why me, why me, why is it so hard on me? All we're going to do is be a bunch of navel gazers down in the pits without seeing the grander reality of what God's doing. Instead, ask the question, how then shall I live? And that's what the preacher is going to do for us in these chapters. So here's the main point for us this morning. To face life as it really is means we live wisely under the hand of a sovereign God. I'm gonna move this mic. I can't see you guys over there. That's better. I got a range. If you're new around here, I'm like, the camera's on me, so I have to stay right here. Otherwise, I'd be up and down these aisles. <laughs> Main point, to face life as it really is means we live wisely under the hand of a sovereign God. We're gonna see two main things today that the preacher's gonna compare and contrast. He's gonna compare wisdom and foolishness, and he's gonna teach us how to live un wisely under the hand of of our sovereign God. And there's just gonna be really two main themes on repeat in these verses. The preacher's gonna say, live with wisdom, don't act a fool. Live with wisdom, don't act a fool. Live with wisdom, don't act a fool on repeat. So here's the questions we're gonna ask. What's wisdom? What's folly? How then do I live wisely? Okay, what's wisdom? What's foolishness? And how do I live wisely? First question I want us to look at this morning, what is wisdom. Now, stepping back to those verses I just read a second ago, if the race doesn't go to the fastest, then I shouldn't train at all. If the battle sometimes goes to the weak and the unprepared, why should I prepare for battle at all? Shouldn't I just live this kind of aimless life where I'm not preparing for anything? It sounds like to pursue wisdom and still be let down, it's just pointless, right? No. That's not what the preacher is going to communicate to us. He's going to show us that even in a world that's not fair, we still should live for the sake of wisdom because wisdom is a beautiful virtue to chase after and embody. Look at, look at verses 13 through 18 with me of chapter 9. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. 
There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered the poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much, much good. Okay, so in this, in this situation the preacher's uh, putting before us, he's saying there's, there's a lot of sad things happening here. A city is being attacked. It's not fortified. It's not prepared for. And most in the city will die in the battle. They're gonna lose the city. But there's just one poor man. He's wise, though. No one listens to him. He's not remembered. And in all of this, a city being attacked, a poor man who's not heard, who's not remembered, the preacher constantly circles back to what? Wisdom. Even though he's not remembered, he still chased after wisdom. Even though the city was still attacked, he chased after wisdom. Even though he was a poor man, he still chased after wisdom. Why? Because the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner, one fool, destroys much. We chase after wisdom. It's this beautiful virtue we should go after. So then what is wisdom. If we should live wisely, even when life's not fair, what is it? Well, we'll get there in a moment, but foolishness is basically living as if there is no God. So the opposite of foolishness is wisdom. The opposite of living as if there is no God is living before the hand of a sovereign God. In the words of Ecclesiastes, foolishness is living a life of vanity underneath the sun. Wisdom, though, is moving towards the God beyond the sun, living in light of his rulership and his goodness. Now, Story Church, one thing I always try to promote before us is the absolute and total sovereignty of God. God is absolutely and totally sovereign over everything in this world, okay? So here's what we have. We either have a God who is totally sovereign or he's not God at all. And as the sovereign God of the universe, he is ruling and reigning over all things. So one of the things I like to lay before you often, Christian, nothing bad can befall you unless it passes through the throne of grace. Do you understand that? You have a good God who is ruler over all things and nothing bad can come your way before first passing through the throne of grace. He's not the author of evil, he doesn't do bad, but we live in a broken world where hard and sinful and harsh things come to us and our good God allows it to happen so that we might see that relying upon this world is fickle, but living for God is where life and joy and meaning is, ha is happening. We live under the hand of a sovereign God and he is always good and everything our sovereign God does is for his glory, for your good, for the joy of others and the embarrassment of Satan. That's what God does. Everything is for his glory, for your good, for the joy of others and for the embarrassment of Satan. And if we understand that even when life is not fair, God is still in charge, it changes the way we live. It shapes the way we live day to day. We're no longer foolish, we'll look at that in a moment, we live wisely under the hand of our sovereign God. And wisdom is moving towards God. So perhaps a, a better way to, to show you this is just to show you an example from church history of what it looks like to live wisely under the hand of a sovereign God. Um, there, there's a famous, semi-famous letter that a missionary that was out in, in, a, in an undercover country kind of couldn't live for Jesus there, persecuted, oppressed, uh, her and her family were sent there, and they sent a letter back home to their supporters to chronicle kind of, here's what's going on in the country. And, and, and it might be hearsay, but word on the street is this family was actually martyred for their faith eventually. But I want you to see how they lived wisely under a sovereign hand, even when life wasn't fair. I'm going to read to you some examples. She chronicles in her journal. Number one, 
There's deep spiritual oppression and harassment. Her response, we're privileged to shine as stars in this inky black night. Mail, packages, wallets stolen, phones are wiretapped. Great reminder that our lives are not our own. No longer do we have the convenience of a car. No longer do we have the expense of a car. Very dangerous driving conditions and traffic. A good public transportation system to use. Tight and challenging financial times facing us now. Many opportunities to prayerfully trust him. Mud-colored tap water flows from our faucets. Sparkling, life-giving water flows from our lives. Many aggressive viruses and lingering illnesses, truly thankful hearts for his healing touch. A cold apartment when you have the flu. Hot drinks, blankets, massages, and prayers that warm us up. Do you see it there? That Christian wisdom is not this mystical, unattainable thing for us to try and get after, but it's a daily understanding of living under the sovereign hand of a good God and constantly moving towards him. As the situations of life befall us, wisdom is found in our response to what comes our way. Right, you heard it there in that missionary. She's like, man, our, our apartment's cold and we have the flu. Praise God for blankets and tea. We don't have a car anymore. We can't get around. At least we don't have to pay for one. Mud color, tap water. We get to preach about the water of life. I mean, come on. That's Christian wisdom right there. Looking at the situations that befall you in life and responding, not in moving away from God, but in moving towards God and trusting him all the more like this missionary family. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. So how do I get it? Well, let's reverse engineer this process together for a second. Wisdom, let's say, is the ability to discern and act upon what is good and right and godly. So we wanna discern and act upon what is God demanding of me? How do I get that? Knowledge. Knowledge of God and his word. This is how you can use wisdom. You can have knowledge without wisdom, but you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. You must know who God is, what he demands of you, what his commands are, how to live obediently before him, and then you can act upon what is right and good. I've heard it said this way. Wis or knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to keep it holstered. Am I right, Chad? <laughs> Our police officer with two broken hands. He kept it holstered. <laughs> Knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to holster it. We must, friends, if we want wisdom, if we want to respond like this missionary and her family to the situations of life, when life isn't fair, if we want to respond in wisdom by moving towards God, friends, you must know God. You must know God. I cannot often enough put before you, church, get your noses in this. Breathe this in. Read this. Eat of the word. Live the word. Let the word get in your veins. Right? If I were Satan, and I'm not, though sometimes my, my kids think I am, if I were Satan, my task to every Christian in this room would be to try to convince you to live a life independent of this word. That's what I would try to do. I'd try to convince you that this is meaningless, that this is hard to read and hard to understand and hard to apply. But Christian, you must absolutely know your word and love your word and get in the word and know the God of this word. Why? So you can believe all the more in God's promises, right? When the bad situations befall you, when you're in financially hard times, when relationships are broken around you, when the world is pressing in, when you get punched in the face by something that happens, we can either move away from God or we can move towards God. And I'm convinced the thing that propels us to move towards God is more and more knowledge of his word. 
Knowledge is what's gathered over time through the study of God's word. It can be said that wisdom, in turn, acts properly upon that knowledge. Wisdom is the fitting application of knowing God through his word. Knowledge understands that the light has turned red. Wisdom applies the brakes. Knowledge sees the quicksand before us. Wisdom walks around it. Knowledge memorizes the Ten Commandments. Wisdom actually obeys them. Knowledge learns of God. Wisdom loves God. Let us, friends, get in the word, know God, and then live wisely before him. What is wisdom? Number two, let's consider what is folly. Now, I'm going to read chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, but as we read here, I want you to remember something. Ecclesiastes is called wisdom literature, that's the genre, and a lot of times in in wisdom literature, you're gonna see a bunch of different things, and as you read this, you might feel like it's just kind of doing this little ping pong thing, where it's going between stories and case studies and maxims and and different illustrations, and it's gonna feel a little back and forth, but let's not get caught in a fool's errand of an interpretive task, because chapter 10 is communicating one thing to us. This, This literature is showing one thing, and you're gonna hear it on repeat. It's saying to us, Don't act a fool. I pity the fool, is what chapter 10 is saying to us. Long before Mr. T, the preacher, was saying it. Don't be a fool. Okay, so let's read chapter 10 together. I'm not gonna put it on the screen because I just told you you need to get your your face in the Bible, so we're gonna do that. Get your face in the Bible. And if you don't bring your Bible to church, that's okay, no shame in that. Just start bringing it, okay? Or grab one and keep it. Chapter 10, verses one through 20. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, And the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what it it is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility and your princes feast at the proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, Do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell the matter. What is folly? Let me just sum up chapter 10 for us a second in one verse here. Psalm chapter 14 verse 1 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's what chapter 10 is communicating to us. If wisdom is moving towards God, then foolishness is saying there is no God. Don't be a fool. What does it mean for us then to say there is no God? What does it mean for us to be a fool? How do I move away from God? Well, what I wanna do is just kinda pan out and look at the book of Ecclesiastes as a whole and see where does Ecclesiastes, where does the preacher reference foolishness and what is he talking about here? So I've got a bunch of points for us. I've got 13, so hang with me here. I'll put them all on the screen. Come on. Wow. (laughs) Number one. The fool does wickedness. 
Wickedness is being deliberately malicious towards people and arrogantly disobedient to God. That's Ecclesiastes chapter seven. So you're deliberately malicious. This means you're planning out evil, right? And, and, and a lot of times when we hear that, we're thinking like some kind of serial killer like Timothy McVeigh, Oklahoma City situation. No, no, deliberate maliciousness oftentimes is thinking, how can I kind of hurt her reputation? What can I say about her to sow seeds of doubt and discord? That's wicked. That's maliciousness. Right? Wickedness is not just violence. Yes, it is violence, but it's also doing what you can to hurt other people and planning it out. Being arrogantly disobedient to God, knowing what he commands of us and pridefully saying, I got this figured out. The fool does wickedness. Number two, the fool is lazy. The fool does not desire hard work of getting knowledge or hard work in earning money. Ecclesiastes chapter four, laziness is a plague in our day. We can sit back and veg on the variety of streaming machines we have. All right, it's like every week there's a new provider saying, we created our platform. It's only $9.99 a month. You're like, man, $9.99 a month, that's a lot less than DirecTV, but it all adds up. And, and, and the worst thing is, it's not about the money, it's about what it creates in us, a bunch of couch potatoes. The fool is lazy. Number three, the fool has a short fuse. He's ill-tempered and rash, Ecclesiastes 7, verse nine. In, in other words, the fool is the one that like when a needle hits a balloon and it explodes, when something pokes you, you explode. And anger is not just marked by screaming and violence and, and kicking and hurting people. Sometimes anger is seething and cutting and even quiet. The fool is short-tempered. Number four, the fool is blind to morality. The fool can't tell right from wrong, and when he can, he chooses wrong, not right. Now, for, for fear of, you know, kind of getting in trouble here, I just, I'll step into it. We live in a day and age where morality can be bent to what's better for us. I can, I can look out right now and tell the difference between a man and a woman, and I don't have a biology degree. I have two kids. I knew which one was a boy the second he was born. I knew which one was a girl the second she was born. And we've bent morality for what reason? And it's not just sexuality and transgenderism. That's wrong. And the fool bends that. It's also what we're doing with marriage. And I'm not just talking about same-sex marriage. That's not God's design for marriage. I'm talking about adultery. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about turning away from your spouse in neglect. We live in a day and age where gender and sexuality is bent to fit our fickle needs. To appease who? Not God. The fool knows what's right and wrong, but is afraid to say it and is afraid to walk in what's right. Number five, the fool doesn't take advice. When wisdom tells him what to do, he ignores it. The fool is hard-headed. Number six, the fool lives a life that's not pleasing to God. His life is like a stench before the nostrils of God, Ecclesiastes five, and, and Ecclesiastes 10, 10, chapter one. It's, it smells disgusting to God the life we live if we're foolish. Number seven, the fool is directionally challenged. He is thoughtless in the way he's going in life. So oftentimes we, we, we characterize the fool as someone who is willingly turning away from God and walking away from him. And yes, that's what foolishness is. But foolishness is also just drifting off course, being thoughtless about life. My pastor in, in Texas, Matt Chandler, says this often. You don't drift into godliness you drift away from godliness. When you put your life in neutral, you're not naturally gonna become more holy and more like Jesus, you're naturally gonna become more unlike him. And the fool is the one who is thoughtless about the direction of their life. They're just being aimless. Like when you're on a Sunday drive and you're just gonna end up where you end up, right? It's more about the journey than the destination, whatever that means. Number, seven, or number eight. The fool doesn't know he's the fool. 
He digs his own pit and produces his own demise. Like the old Westerns where someone throws you a shovel and says, dig your own grave. That's what a fool does. He digs his own grave. Number nine, the fool is a manipulator. He thinks he can charm his way in or out of anything. And a guy, as a guy who's charmed my way out of a lot of speeding tickets, I'm a fool. You think I'm joking? The fool has loose lips. He's marked by talking too much, liking to hear himself or herself, gossip, slander, and hurtful words. Um, I, I've heard it said before, uh, Scott Saul's pastor in Nashville says, gossip and slander, loose lips, it's called verbal, verbal pornography, right? So, so here's what we do. We talk about pornography and we're like, it's this victimless crime. No, it's not. No, it's not. Pornography ruins everyone. There's women caught up in sex trafficking because of pornography, and it's evil, and we must be against it. But it just doesn't, doesn't just ruin that. It ruins your own life. We see marriages fall apart because of pornography addiction. We see guys in their 20s unable to get erections because they're so addicted to pornography. That's an actual thing. And it's ruining us. And we think that gossip and slander, just like pornography, is this victimless crime. No one's hurting it. If she can't hear me, then, then I didn't actually hurt anyone. No, you're not just destroying that person because Ecclesiastes 10 tells us a bird's gonna carry those words. In other words, if you're gossiping, so is everyone else. And whatever you say to someone else, they're gonna go say to someone else and the telephone game's gonna happen and they're gonna hear. But it's not just ruining other people. Gossip and slander is ruining your heart. For from the heart flow the springs of life. If we're gossiping, if we're slandering, if we've got loose lips, man, we must be aware there's something broken down inside our hearts. Number 11, the fool doesn't grow up. The fool has Peter Pan syndrome and lives as a perpetual child with childlike pursuits and playing children's games. That's Ecclesiastes 10, verse 16, self-explanatory. Number 12, the fool is a drunkard. Drunkenness is the inability to make proper decisions due to a clouded mind and lowered inhibitions. And drunkenness is not purely about alcohol. Yes, it is. But it's about substances that cloud our minds. So it's more than just alcohol. It's certainly alcohol. And, and friends, we are called to live lives aware of God and aware of what's going on around us. And to walk in drunkenness lowers that awareness. And the scriptures say, we're a fool because we're gonna make foolish decisions. Final one here. The fool is a sloth. The fool has no zeal for life, for other people, or for the things of God, similar to laziness. Now, as I, I read all of those things, you might be sitting there thinking, man, that's harsh. And it is. But that's what the word of God does to us. It cuts us up. It shows us, like a mirror, shows us the brokenness and sinfulness in our lives. And I'm sitting here reading through those things and I'm convicted. I'm convicted of, of the areas that I fall short and I sin against God and against other people because I live like a fool. So the question is, are you foolish? Because your foolishness will destroy you and it will destroy others, okay? Final, final question here, how do I live wisely? So the preacher is basically saying, don't be a fool, act wisely. Okay, I get it, how? How do I live wisely then? I don't wanna live like a fool. You're telling me, preacher, not to be a fool, I get it, I want to be wise, what do I do? Well, wisdom is one of those virtues that's kind of like humility, right? You've ever been with someone that tells you how humble they are, which is actually the moment where you're like, you're freaking prideful, right? If you have to tell someone how strong you are, that's how weak you are. If you have to tell someone how humble you are, that's how prideful you are. So wisdom is not one of those things that you're just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be wise by saying I'm wise. You don't even, friends, chase after wisdom in of itself. You chase after the things around wisdom. Colossians 2 and 1 Corinthians 1 tell us that Jesus Christ is wisdom in the flesh. So if you want to live a wise life, you chase not after wisdom, you chase after Jesus Christ. And from the virtues and the characteristics and the traits of Jesus, we then become wise. We don't have to tell anyone we're wise. 
So instead of saying, how do I be wise? I'd just say, go get wise. Here's what I want to do. I want to look at some traits of wisdom that Jesus showed us and how if we can chase after those things, the wise life will surely follow after it. Uh, And and just because I'm not a fan of plagiarism, uh, this is Kent Hughes in his commentary called Preach the Word. He helped me really a a lot here in this section. He gives uh, seven different traits of someone who lives wisely. So, So here's what we should chase after, friends. Number one, be thankful. Be thankful. The fool loses sight of the blessings of God and gets bogged down on life's troubles. Again, remember back to that missionary in her journal saying, we lost a car. Thankful I don't have to pay for one anymore. That's wisdom right there. Cultivate this life of thankfulness. Okay, and so let me, let me just speak to the parents for a second here. Um, a lot of times... We, we get together and we start complaining about our kids. They're so hard, man. They're so disobedient. They don't let us sleep. Guess what? If you had a kid, you're signing up for a life of sleeplessness. It's just what comes with it. It's a package deal, friends. And instead of getting bogged down on how annoying our kids are, what if we thank God for the opportunity to have little kids in our home that we get to disciple and share the gospel with and train to be missionaries and citizens in this world? Like, how cool is that? God entrusted fools like us with people? Are you kidding me? How grateful can you be? We haven't had a date night in three months. You have two kids you get to eat dinner with every night. Share the gospel with, pray for, encourage. Come on. Never mind the fact that there's a ton of people out there that desperately want kids that can't have them. We're sitting there complaining about it. Be thankful. Number two, be content. Can you guys tell I haven't preached in two weeks? (laughs) Be content. Grumbling versus gratitude. Remember back to the book of Exodus when the Israelites cross the Red Sea and and God provides a miracle for them, spreads the Red Sea. They walk across on dry ground and then Pharaoh and all of his armies get swallowed up in it and they stand on dry ground. And just a couple of days later after being miraculously delivered by God, what do the Israelites do? Oh, it's so hard in the desert. You're not in slavery anymore. Are you kidding me? Friends, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, you have nothing to complain about. You are no longer captive to your sin and to Satan. Jesus has delivered you from the power of sin, from the power of hell, and from the grips of Satan. You are delivered into the hands of a mighty God who loves you and cares for you and will save you now and forevermore. You've got nothing to complain about. To have everything without Jesus is to have nothing. To have nothing with Jesus is to have everything. Be content. Number three, be prayerful. James chapter five says, ask for wisdom. Right? Be prayerful. Ask God for it. Number four, be humble. Confidence in God, not yourself. That's humility, friends. We're oftentimes waking up and strategizing, how can I fix this? How can I solve that? How can I make things go my way? What if we just got before God with empty hands of faith and said, God, I actually don't have it together. I can't accomplish this. I can't make things happen. But you can. Nothing's too hard for our God. Be humble. Be confident in him. Number five, be generous. Be generous. Living a life for the love of money is foolishness because only things done for Jesus will last. Only things done for Jesus will last into eternity. How you live right now has eternal ramifications and how you live with your money right now has eternal ramifications. And if we were to live lives of greater and greater generosity, we would be less enticed by money And here's the thing, money baits you. And what's on the other end of bait? A hook. It hooks you right in the mouth and it drags you straight to your death. Money will promise you a bill of goods it cannot deliver upon. 
Be generous and you will live wisely. Be faithful. Be faithful. God is responsible for fruit. You're responsible for faithfulness. John chapter 15 tells us to abide in the vine, and as we abide in the vine faithfully, he will bear much fruit through our living. That's a promise, that's a guarantee, but nowhere in John chapter 15 does it say, go and produce fruit, go and save souls. Salvation belongs to God alone. You can't save souls, God can. Your job is not to go produce things in your life or in the lives of others around you. Your job is to be faithful in the ordinary stuff of life. What has God given you? A job, a family, friends, money, something that you're a steward over and your job every day is to wake up and say, God, how can I use this for the sake of your kingdom? Not mine. Be faithful. And then number seven, be hopeful. Be hopeful. The wise does not know the future, but the wise knows the God of the future. The wise knows that God is already in tomorrow working for his glory and for our good. He's already there. That's why I don't have to borrow tomorrow's troubles. They're gonna come. I got today's troubles to worry about. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna cultivate a heart of hope knowing that the future is incredibly bright and the best is yet to come. And the best is yet to come, maybe not here on earth, right? Life's not fair, we've talked about that. The best is yet to come though in eternity when death will fully and finally and forever be beaten, when sin will be eradicated, when disease will be no more, when we won't lose loved ones, when relationships will not break. That is our guaranteed future. What is today? If we were to read Ecclesiastes, we would say today is like vapor. It's vanishing, like the weeds of the field, it sprouts one day and then boom, it disintegrates. We live for eternity and we're hopeful, friends. No matter what's going on with the economy, no matter who the president is, no matter what wars are breaking out, we, friends, should be the most hopeful people in the world. Because our God is alive, he is active, he is for me, not against me. He is for you, not against you. And he is working all things out for your good. This is what the word says to us. This is how we live wisely. Now, we have wisdom, this idea of moving towards God. We have foolishness, the idea of moving away from God, saying there is no God. We have the traits and the behaviors of the wise and of the foolish. And we can diagnose where we are on the scale and unless you're afraid to say it yourself, I'll say it for you. You're a fool. I'm a fool. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good news, friends. Jesus didn't come to save the wise. He came to save the fool. Jesus didn't come for those who are well. He came to set up a hospital for the sick and the dying. That's who Jesus came for. So what do we do, friends? We confess with our mouths before God, I am a fool. Whatever it might be, whatever it looks like for you, say, I'm desperately in need of you, God. I need the very wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, to come and to save me and to set my life on solid ground so that I might walk the wise life. And here's what's gonna happen, friends. Jesus is going to save you the moment you confess, the moment you turn from your sin, you are fully and freely and forever forgiven of all of your fool's errands, every one of them. Now and forevermore, you are forgiven. He's gonna set your feet on solid ground. And what are you gonna do? Just like the Israelites, you're gonna turn and look for slavery again. You're gonna be a fool again. Probably today, if we're being honest. But, but what does that mean? It just means that's more opportunity for the grace and the mercy of Jesus to shine. Where he says again and again and again, you're mine, you're forgiven, you're loved, I don't condemn you, not ever. There's nothing you can do to make, you, make me love you less. There's nothing you can do to make me love you more. You can try and be the wisest person on earth, better than Solomon, and Jesus ain't gonna love you more. That's works-based righteousness, friends. This isn't a license to be a fool. We wanna be wise. But when we screw up, and screw up we will, Jesus is gonna be right there to say, I love you. I love you. 
you're still mine. So I don't want you to hear anything today and be like, man, I'm a fool. I might as well leave this place. (laughs) Nope. The number one fool in the room is the guy with the mic attached to his face. But I'm also loved by Jesus, forgiven by Jesus, cared for by Jesus. So I don't know what you're feeling right now. But if what you're feeling is condemnation, that's not from the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You might be feeling conviction, and conviction from the Holy Spirit of God is good and to be embraced because the conviction of the Spirit says, there's a better way. I promise you there's a better way. The life you're living is not worth it. But if you turn from your sin and trust in me, on the other end of obedience is always joy, is always hope, is always life, It's always happiness. Even when life's not fair, we have Jesus, and Jesus is better. So friends, I don't want you to feel condemnation. If you're feeling that, please look to the cross. That's where Jesus put our sin on display. He canceled our record of debt, and then he went into the grave with every bit of our foolishness. All of our foolishness was buried with Jesus 2,000 years ago. And when he got up out of that grave, our foolishness stayed there. And when you trust in Jesus, God doesn't see you as a fool. He sees you as a son or a daughter. And just like any good father, he's saying, hey, come with me. You're mine. Follow me. You have my name. Do my will. Live for Jesus. The one application point I have every week, friends, trust Jesus. Love Jesus. Follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we do thank you for Jesus. That though we were fools, dead in our sins and trespasses, Ephesians 2 says, we are forgiven and loved and made new because you, God, are rich in mercy. So I pray for anyone in this room right now that might be feeling condemned for their foolishness, would your spirit fill them and show them that condemnation is not the way of Jesus. Grace and mercy and salvation is. And then God, as we follow you in grace and in mercy, as we live a life of love that you have gifted to us, you've freely gifted to us, will we live lives of wisdom? As you put our feet on solid ground, will we walk that way, trusting in you, trusting in your promises, living obediently when life's not fair, when suffering sets in, will we still follow you, knowing that on the other end of our obedience is more joy to be found, more peace to be found, more hope to be found. God, would you make Story Church a wise people? And God, when we fail, when we are fools, we thank you that we have your everlasting mercy and grace to lean upon again and again and again for forgiveness and for hope. I pray you would help us to see you rightly, to worship you rightly, and to be convinced to trust in anything other than you is foolish, but to trust in you alone is wisdom. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.